So the question was asked, can we have an organization which runs only with code, which is completely decentralized and autonomous? Is this, is this something which is possible? Is this something we even want? Usually we are used to structures which are, look more like this. You have a head, they have managers, they have even more managers, they have employees, and that's how current companies are, are built up. And why, why is this so? Well, first of all, it's very efficient sometimes, it's easy to set up, it's what we are used to. But when we analyze this structure, what's this all about? It's all about people and contracts. They have a certain contract with, with each other, who's allowed to do what, who has which rights and which permissions. And it has some flaws, this centralized system. There is a single point of failure. So when it comes to corruption, or just people making mistakes, it has a large influence on the organization. Also, you cannot really leverage the wisdom of the crowd. There may be a lot of people in your company who do know a lot of different things, and together they are very powerful, but that's more than a single man can know. Also, all this process is usually done with a lot of paperwork, a lot of meetings, a lot of things need to be written down. And if you think about a company, it's really those contracts, what they are, you first need something um, to record the rules, the contracts or the bylaws of a company, so to say. You need a way how to interact with them. You do need a way to enforce those laws. And if you think about a decentralized autonomous organization, how could you do all those things if there's no one who actually does this, who writes down the contracts, who is there someone who enforces that some things are done, like a voting is done and the result is executed. And then we want to do things like manage money. So every organization, or the most of them, in some, in some way or another, manage money to flow from A to B. And we also don't want to use PayPal, Visa, MasterCard, because they are also centralized, and if they fail, then the organization starts to fail. So we don't want to have this. So is there any possibility of, is there any technology out there which can give us this? A serverless infrastructure, no server, no central company, and we can still do money and value transfers, we can enforce contracts and laws, and actually it turns out that such a thing exists. And this is called blockchain technology. Maybe the first time you heard about blockchain technology was maybe Bitcoin. Maybe some of you have heard of Bitcoin. They use blockchain technology. But this was only the first use case. This was about building a decentralized cryptocurrency, trying to make money decentralized, which is already a huge step. Now there is another technology called Ethereum, which I've worked for the last two years, and there we go one step further. We added the possibility to write something we call smart contracts. What are smart contracts? Well, this is just a piece of code. It's code which, is, which writes down who is allowed to do what. It's a permission system. So you can really encode which rights a single person has. And he can then also execute and force its right on the same system. And the system works without any intermediary. So let me try to explain to you what a blockchain is, what Ethereum is. So first, it's a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network. So there's no head, there's no central authority, it's just single peers which are connected. And they all run their machine. And the interesting part is they all share the same data. So they have their data, and they execute exactly the same code. So you could think of it as a world computer, how Gavin would put it, one computer we all have access to. We all can read from this computer, see what's going on, so you have 100% transparency, and you can also write to it under certain rules. And this is what Ethereum is mainly about. So it's my favorite term for a blockchain or translation for it, it's actually a decentralized permission ledger. It stores who's allowed to do what. In the case of Bitcoin, it's who's allowed to send X Bitcoins from A to B. In the case of Ethereum, it's even more. You can code what a certain group of people is actually allowed to do, and under which conditions they may move money from A to B. So you can have value transfers. And this is now this very powerful tool, but how can you access it? I mean, you can download the software, but what gives you this right? What, what makes it so safe and secure? If you have a your know, email server, you usually have an email address and a password, and you use this for logins for many different things. In blockchains, we use something different. 
we actually use a public and private key pair. So this is now maybe the most technical slide, but I think it's important to understand why this empowers the individual. Everyone can generate with their software a public and private key pair. The public key is something like the number of your bank account. It can be completely public, everybody can know it, and can, they can use it to send money to you. Then you have a private key. This is stored very securely on your computer, usually encrypted, and you use this to sign a message. So you can think about it like when you have a signature under a contract and just sign something. And this signed message then goes into this peer-to-peer -peer network of computers, they just send it there, they send it to their peers, they send it to their peers, and it gets sent around. Everybody reads it and sees, yes, the owner of the private key, which belongs to this public key, has signed this message. So I can now check if he's allowed to do certain things after the rules of the blockchain. If yes, I execute it. And that's how everyone can basically use the system anonymously and interact with it. You have something like a ID, a, digi a real digital ID which you own, which is not owned by any centralized company or server. And this is so powerful because if you think of it, um, there are about yeah, two billion unbanked people in the world, but they do have a smartphone, even in Africa and other developing countries. And now with this technology, they can generate a key pair and can have access to the global financial world. And with smart contracts, they can have access to insurance services, notary services, stock markets, and all kinds of things. So this is very powerful because there is no registration or login. Everyone can have multiple keys and log in into the system. So this is now the basement of what I want to talk about. We need this blockchain technology. And this can then empower such a decentralized autonomous organization. And now I want to tell you a story which is a pretty interesting one and has been yeah, a very interesting experience the last couple of months. We as a company, Slocket, we are working on decentralizing the sharing economy by putting objects on the blockchain so people can use them with payments. They can basically pay objects and then use it, completely decentralized and peer-to-peer. -peer. And we thought in the beginning, let's do a crowdfunding um, to see how many people are interested in this and we can build this product. When I wrote a smart contract for the crowdfunding, because we didn't need to use any platform, we could do it on our own, I thought, why not giving those people who give money to it more power? When they give money, they can receive a token, a digital token, which is very similar to a Bitcoin or any other virtual coin, which can be traded and which gives you permissions to do certain things. So let's say maybe they could vote on what we are doing. So we can ask them, should we do this or that, and they can vote with their tokens. Then we then wanted to go even further. Why not even giving them full control over the money? Basically, we have to ask them, make a proposal, so they release money after we met certain milestones or certain requirements. And then we thought, why not even give them more power? Make it completely decentralized, get us out of the picture, just make an organization that people can give money into, in the form of virtual currency, and then they can decide by voting where this money will go and which projects they will give it to. And it was in the beginning sort of like a decentralized company. So this looks like this. So you would have the DAO, Decentralized Autonomous Organization, which job it was to security hold Ether, which is the virtual currency used in the Ethereum blockchain, um, track who owns the DAO tokens, the trading, and have basically the governance system in it. It was more or less like a joint bank account. Many people put something in, and they can then decide what to do with this. And then you would have contractors, so our company would have been one of those, who say, I want to work for this company, and I also make a smart contract, and there I write in, I want to have a monthly payment of this much, and I will do this for you, and you will get rewards kind of for some system, whatever this company is doing, the business model, so to say. And this was the idea, and it got a lot of traction. We wrote a smart contract, we asked people who want to join, we had a, a Slack channel of about 6,000 people who wanted to help, and after the version 1.0 of this code was released, it got immediately pushed to the blockchain and people wanted to start it down. And what happened, we had about um, 23,500 addresses um, giving money into this smart contract, money in the form of a virtual currency called Ether, so it was not completely fairly distributed. There were about 42% uh, 
uh, or 50 of the token holders owned 42% of the DAO. So we had a, some people gave a lot of money and some people only gave little. But it still was an enormous amount of people. But more impressively, in the beginning we started, and you saw it raising $1 million, goes to $5 million. This was already a bit scary. $5 million in such an experimental smart contract. $10 million, $30 million, $50 million, $100 million. I didn't feel well at this moment. <laughs> um, $150 million. And then in four weeks, this decentralized autom autonomous organization without any head raised $150 million. This was scary. And okay, four weeks over. Um, a lot of excitement. Be because of this, also the price of this virtual currency ESA did increase, which actually led to the point, at some point, the DAO did actually hold $220 million just because the ESA price went up. So this was something very big and yeah, very interesting experience. So we worked on this, and then something happened which nobody did expect. Friday morning, 8 o'clock, um, my brother was calling me on the phone saying there's something strange happening. Can you have a look at uh, blockchain? Something's happening there, it doesn't look regular. I looked at it and I saw there was money going out in a very irregular way, which should not happen, and we found out later there was actually a bug or an error in the smart contract. Meaning there was a hacker able to steal or try to steal money from it. So in, in about a couple of hours, he tried to actually, yeah, t uh, had $50 million worth of Ether flown from the smart contract into, into another smart contract. I don't want to go into the details, but nevertheless, a hacker stole $50 million. This was now when things get very serious. And what to do now? And this is a long, long story. Um, in the end, the Ethereum community, which are basically the ones running this peer-to-peer -peer network, helped us out there and basically decided to do something we call a hard fork, basically update the whole system to give the money back to the, in, the original um, investors or people who gave money into it. So the good, the happy end is, yes, everyone got their money back, but on the other hand, it was a very um, hard lesson we learned a very, very hard way. So there was um, T.S. Eliot who said, you never know how far you can go until you've gone too far. And I think I can say, yes, we've gone too far, and I have to humbly admit we failed. And if you think about all those talks you heard today, about pushing it to the limits, there are no limits, go as far as you can, and just do it, you know? <laughs> we did it, yes, and <laughs> we failed. So, how, what's the next step? That that's now when it, when it gets really interesting. How do you react to such a thing? I have to say, I had to, have to take a little break for a couple of weeks after this, I was very released when the people got their money back. But on the other hand, um, people were still very interested in decentralized autonomous organizations. The concept could not really be tested just because there was a, a bug or mistake in this contract. So what are the next steps? I mean, the first planes did crash, but planes still were a very good idea. And people continued to work on those things until they really took off. And so we decided, what can we do with this concept and use all of those lessons learned, and there were many lessons learned. For example, I have, of course, much more security. Have a fail-safe, which maybe in the beginning is centralized, but take baby steps from centralization to decentralization. And many more lessons which are learned in this. And take it to something else. And we thought the best thing to take it to is actually something which we call the charity DAO. Uh, another DAO another decentralized autonomous organization, but this time with a very narrow focus on being non-profit and giving to charity. And why this? Why did we focus on this one? It had several reasons. But one thing, actually, yes, we want to do something good in the world. We want to tackle the really big problems, like world hunger, poverty, um, and you can tackle them. But what is the main reason people don't give more money to charities? Today, it's about 2.1% of the GDP. And the main reason is, people say, I don't know what will happen with the money, there is no transparency, and I don't have any control over what is happening. And those two points are exactly the ones we are tackling with the charity DAO. Where we say, people have full control over the funds, they can vote where they are going, 
If they're too lazy to, to vote, they can choose a delegate who is representing them to vote for them, but at any time they can withdraw the power from this delegate, give it to another, or vote themselves. So they have full control over their funds, and on the blockchain, everything is transparent. So you can see every single thing which is happening, who got how much money, and they will be accountable for this. So this will be the next step. And I'm looking forward to experiment more with decentralized autonomous organization. And this charity DAO is one example of how it can be used. But I think this will go much, much further in the, in the future. Not only for investment funds, funds or crowdfunding, but it will only also be applied to companies and to organizations. They say, you can code in who's allowed to do what and have those rights, have transparent companies, having things which are completely automated because the smart contract will always do what's written in the smart contract. So this can change how companies work. This can change how nonprofits work. And one day I hope this even can change how our government works. If we can vote transparently on the blockchain, counting votes there is much, much easier than you saw in the US election. So there is so much power in this concept to give power back to the people but this can only happen if we actually and we use it. We have to say we want to have this power, we demand transparency, we demand the usage of public blockchains for certain systems. And if we do so, we will have the power back to the people, and then it's not that we have a single point of failure, one president who can screw everything up. No, we can actually screw it up, or we can actually build, fix things and make things much, much better. Having a healthy democracy where we can transparently see what is happening on the blockchain. So I'm very excited for the future. I think we have to tackle the big problems now, and we have to start now, and we also have to never give up and uh, no matter what's happening, and sing things from the ground up again, and re-engineer our, our system today. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>